In this video, I want to address a question that was asked um, by Mrs. Rosario. So is God's wrath a part of his correction as well? I know it is to bring his people low and submit to him. So I believe this is a really important question, and it's really important that we understand the function of God's wrath and his trumpets. When God sends his wrath, well, actually, let's first differentiate between God's trumpets and then his great wrath. So God does nothing without warning through his prophets first. We're told that in Amos. He does nothing without warning through his prophets first. So we should know that God has established a pattern and he's going to stay true to that pattern. He's not going to switch it up or change things. And the reason why he established this pattern is because he really doesn't want to send us grief. Lamentations 3.33 tells us he does not send grief willingly. So he's done certain things. He's established rules for his children. He has told us, if you obey these rules, I'm going to bless you. If you disobey, I'm going to punish you. There's no middle ground. You're either obeying or you're disobeying. He sends his prophets to warn us. So he establishes the rules and then he sends his prophets to let us know that we've gotten too far, that we're not obeying the things that he established and that we need to return to him. Now that we have his Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit also does that. His Holy Spirit calls us in and convicts us when we've gotten far, convicts us when we're doing things that are in opposition to his will. The other thing that he uses is our design. I've told you before in different videos that we have a feeling of fear and then God talks about a spirit of fear. He gives us the feeling of fear because we are to fear him and we are to fear being separated from him. So when we feel a feeling of fear, we need to recognize that as him calling us back in, him calling us to return. When we feel that feeling of fear and we, for example, start to try to control circumstances in our lives in order to make that feeling go away, in order to relieve our anxieties, we are handed over to, we're actually handed over to that spirit of fear. And the reason why is because we engaged in idolatry, we engaged in the work of our own hands instead of returning to God, which is what he has commanded. He wants us to understand very clearly who we are to him and who he is to us and to not end up in a situation where we're succumbing to the flesh in order to alleviate whatever it is that he has sent to call us in. So when we continue to spurn him and choose to engage in idolatry of self, idolatry of others, whatever it is that we are doing in order to avoid returning to him, he will hand us over to that spirit. And we know why he hands us over to that spirit. Paul told us very quick, very clearly, it is for the destruction of the flesh that we might be saved. I've shared with you that God brought me to the brink of death before bringing me to his son, drawing me to his son. And then his son proved himself to me, wooed me to him, proving himself to me, and then showing me where that was in the word. I was not familiar with the Bible whatsoever when he drew me to the son, when the son started proving himself to me. And there would have been no way for me to truly receive him in the way that I received him because my flesh was so powerful. My flesh was so strong in being able to pull me away. And I had not known even that it was a requirement to discipline my physical flesh and circumcise from all of that willful desire for self that I had lived in for so long. So much of that having to do with the traumatic, um, unresolved suffering that I had experienced as a child and doing the best I knew how, looking to the world to tell me who I was supposed to be because I didn't have any direction. So there's a lot of us who are, who are doing that ignorantly, but it doesn't matter. I've told you that so many times that Christ said, if you sin with knowledge, you're going to receive a large lashing. But if you sin without knowledge, ignorantly, that you will receive a small lashing. And the reason why we receive a small lashing is because God loves us enough to discipline us. He loves us enough to teach us. Now, I've also told you in videos that when you discipline your body, for example, if you're going to run a race or you're going to run a marathon, you're going to train and you're going to discipline your body. You're not going to beat your body into submission. So these ideas that we have about discipline in the world because of 
parents who were ill-equipped, parents who were, you know, followed a deceptive counterfeit teaching, who justified beating their children or harsh punishment, uh, particularly based on scripture. There's people that still believe that spare the rod, spoil the child means to beat your child. Of course, it does not mean that. The rod in scripture is the shepherd's rod. A shepherd doesn't beat their sheep back into the fold. They use the rod to nudge them back into the fold. And so it is with the good shepherd. I mean, you can't imagine Jesus just going out there with a, you know, uncontrolled, which usually when a parent is beating their child, they don't have control over themselves, going out there uncontrolled and beating his sheep back into the fold. I mean, come on. That's not how he treats us. He is not uncontrolled. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's very methodical about it. He has established a pattern in the way that he disciplines us. And yes, he does indeed. His wrath is serious, but it is not because he is somehow uncontrolled or hasn't given us so many opportunities along the way to get it together, to respond to him, to be disciplined by him. So I think I started to say, and then went, went somebody somewhere else, the first seven or the first six trumpets that God blows are part of his wrath. They are indeed part of his wrath, but his great wrath will not come until after the seventh trumpet is blown. Anyone who is left here on the earth after the seventh trumpet is blown, who does not participate in the resurrection, is going to endure his great wrath. That is straight up punishment. That is going to be very terrible. But we also do know that there are some who may be saved during the, or after the thousand year reign, during the time where everyone comes back to life in the second resurrection and Satan goes back out to deceive those in the four corners of the earth. And he does in fact succeed at that, even though people went through God's great wrath. But it does appear that there will be some who will be given the opportunity to be saved, even as one escaping the flames, even if just as one escaping the flames. They will not have the same honor or glory that those who participate in the first resurrection will have. Just as John said, blessed are those who participate in the first resurrection. They are holy and will be priests of God and will reign with him for a thousand years. Totally different honor and glory, but there are some who will be saved even if only as one escaping the flames. They don't have a reward, they don't have honor, and they don't have glory. They don't have an inheritance, even from the prince. We see that in Ezekiel uh, when he's talking about the, the third temple. So let's talk about the trumpets. And, and by the way, the trumpets are not exclusive. I mean, I was experiencing God's wrath when he brought me to the brink of death. That was definitely God's wrath. It was also him disciplining me. So the thing we need to understand is that unlike us, you know, we're not righteous the way that God is righteous. We don't have the capacity to, um, you know, for example, judge another person, at least not now. Paul tells us that God's people are indeed going to judge others, but we don't have that ability right now while we are in this, this sinful state. But God does not contend with these things. He's not in the flesh. He doesn't contend with the flesh. He is perfect and righteous. So when God sends wrath, when we have wrath, we are really vulnerable to becoming evil and enacting that evil on another person in order to vindicate ourselves. And we have all kinds of justifications for that. So we're really not capable of holding all of that until we're made holy and until we're separated from this sinful state. Nevertheless, when God is doing this, He hands us over for the destruction of the flesh. He is always sovereign. It's not that he hands us over to Satan because he hates us or despises us or wants to destroy us. He indeed actually wants for us to be saved. He does want for us to be healed and to receive that healing from him. Nevertheless, we have to experience our consequences. What happens when you have a parent who does not give their child consequences? They end up unruly. And quite frankly, they end up spoiled. They're ruined. No one wants to be around them. They're not the pleasure that God created them to be. They are not a source of enjoyment. And it's the same with us. We cannot possibly please God 
when we are living in the undisciplined, when we are living in undisciplined flesh by the sinful flesh, we become a source of displeasure and grief for God. We also become a source of displeasure and grief for ourselves. If you've ever watched um, Super Nanny, that's a really good example of what happens when you have an undisciplined, no consequences, no rules established. When that, when you have a home like that, and you have irresponsible parents who are not who are not taking care of their children and they're not teaching their children and they're not being consistent with their children and giving them consequences or timeouts and things like that and explaining to them this is why you were you know placed in timeout this is why I brought this on you everybody in the house is miserable parents don't even want to come home from work because they don't want to go to the nightmare that is their home and then when you see that you know, super nanny comes in and she teaches the family how to have certain rules, have consistent and reliable structure. The children no longer have the power in the home. The power is set up properly. The parents get on the same team other than being split. So they are of one mind. They establish their authority. They give consequences. They help the children to understand These are the rules. When you obey the rules, you get these rewards. When you disobey the rules, you will experience these punishments. Isn't that interesting that this just mimics exactly what God does with us, what he established with his people? And if we had just followed that template of what God told us to do, what he told us, this is the way I'm going to parent you, this is the way you are to parent your children— train them up in the way they should go, spare the rod, spoil the child. If we had just sat and sought to understand the heart of our God and what he does with his own children and how he expects us to raise his children and then raise them up to him, we would have been just fine. But we have all kinds of dumb ideas. And I find it really interesting that Super Nanny is, you know, obviously it's a TV show, so who knows what what happens in certain situations, but I have found that I'm a parent. I'm also, you know, work with other parents. So I can testify that these things work. This works. God's ways work. And I I don't believe that Super Nanny has any kind of, you know, necessarily like a, a worldly degree or something like that. I believe she was a nanny since she was like 18 years old. And this is what she observed was good. This is what she observed worked. And yet it is all confirmed, or at least those methods that I just described to you are all confirmed and established in the Bible. It's nothing new. This is what God does with us. So it should not be surprising that he set up a way for us to understand what it is to parent. Even if we don't have biological children, you know, I've I've said to you before, all of us are going to be responsible for having spiritual children, right? Those with whom we're sharing the message, those with whom we're raising to Christ, those with whom we are also feeling some grief, right? When they separate from God, when they, you know, become rebellious, we experience that. We experience that with our own children. And to be honest, we we need to experience that. We need to experience that grief. We need to experience the things that God experiences with us because that's the only way that we're going to appreciate the infinite love and compassion that he has given us, the infinite patience that he has as he teaches us, as he disciplines us back to him. Unlike us, God is righteous even in his wrath. There is always good that is intended even in his wrath. So here's the pattern. He establishes rules He says, when I send these things, you are to understand that you need to return to me. When I send plagues, locusts, natural, you know, what we call natural disasters, right? Hail, fire. When I send these things, you're to recognize that I'm calling you in, that you've gotten far and you need to return to me. That's a form of wrath. It's also a form of discipline. It's not one or the other. It's both. If you disobey me, I'm going to do things like send you into captivity I'm going to punish you for your sins seven times over. If you continue to disobey me and you don't return to me, I'll punish you again for your sins seven times over. And then he details all of the things that he's going to do. But before he starts really 
sending grief. He sends prophets and witnesses and his Holy Spirit to warn us. In these end times, when God is blowing these trumpets, trumpets one through four are going to be during the time that the witnesses are here. So the witnesses start prophesying. They start calling people in. When people are not return, when God's people are not returning, he begins to blow those trumpets. Why? Because he established a pattern in which he said, I don't do anything unless I warn my prophets first or warn through my prophets first. We don't listen. He starts sending trumpets. He starts sending other warnings and wrath. So it's concurrent. It's not one or the other. It's both. He is sending wrath. He's bringing us low. He's disciplining us and he's doing everything in love. This is his love because it's the only way that we would return. It's the only way that we would return. He tried to cleanse us and we would not be cleansed. Therefore, we will not be clean again until his wrath is complete. He tells us the reasons why this is going to happen. And I explained to you, I've explained to you in several videos that our grief is necessary. Me being brought to the brink of death was necessary in order for me to hear his voice. It was necessary in order for me to understand that I had, <laughs> I had just run everything into the ground. None of those things healed me. I only was getting worse. I was on the brink of death. My daughter was suffering because she knew I was going to die. And so when God said to me, you're about to unlearn everything you think you know, even even at that time, I still thought he was going to somehow use my degree and my wisdom. I mean, where had my wisdom gotten me that far? Even then, I still thought that. But the thing that was true is that he had brought me into position to where I would actually listen to him. That was absolutely needed for this knucklehead. My flesh was so incredibly strong. So he had to break it down in order for me to be saved. He has to continue to break it down in order for me to be saved on the day of the Lord. The degree to which we are going to experience the severity of his wrath and grief is largely dependent on how quickly we return to him, how genuinely and sincerely we rend our hearts when we return to him. The trumpets absolutely are part of God's wrath. But understand that it is the only way that we will return to him in the way that is necessary for us to be saved. God remains righteous even in his wrath. So before the fifth trumpet is blown, we know that wickedness will still be so incredibly intense on this earth that the witnesses are going to be killed Many people still will not have returned to him. We do know that some of God's people are still going to be on the earth because when the fifth trumpet blows, it passes over those who have the seal of God. Therefore, we know that people who are his are going to be here and they'll be working with the next sort of set of people teaching and harvesting in. Nevertheless, you have trumpets five and six that wrath is going to increase. You even see in Revelation 8, 13, John says, as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair calling out in a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So God's wrath is increasing. And we know that, all, you know, four trumpets have blown. Now we got five and six are the only trumpets left before Christ comes. Once the seventh trumpet blows, you've already been separated into one of two categories. One that's going to go to condemnation and experience God's great wrath. One that is going to be resurrected in the sky with Christ. Those who are resurrected are blessed and holy. They will be priests of God and will reign with him for a thousand years. They, their salvation is fulfilled at that time. They have fulfilled their covenant. They have been resurrected. Those who go to condemnation, those who remain on the earth are going to experience God's great wrath. Anyone who has received the mark of the beast and bowed down to the idol, the abomination of desolation, they will not be saved, period. They will not be saved. Anyone who receives the mark of the beast will not be saved. That's a, that is definitive. That is affirmed in Revelation. But there are others who, live, who have lived on the earth who died before this choice was to be made to receive the mark of the beast. They will be given an opportunity. They will be killed by the sword of his mouth. 
so they will experience the second death after God's great wrath. They will be killed by the sword of his mouth. They're going to be convicted of what they have done. They're going to be experiencing that for a thousand years. Then they are going to come to life again after the thousand years have ended. By the way, if you want to understand what that means to be killed by the sword of his mouth, there's a video on the channel entitled Slain in the Spirit. That term is being widely misused within counterfeit Christianity. Slain in the Spirit. I recommend that you listen to that video if you do not understand what that means and how it is that we are slain in the Spirit by God's Holy Spirit when he convicts us. Not when someone hits us on the head and we fall over. That's, that's a show. That is a scam. Slain in the Spirit is when God's Spirit convicts us. That is what's going to happen by the two-edged sword that comes out of Christ's mouth. The word is sharper than a two-edged sword. He is that sword. That sword comes from the mouth of God. So that's what the wicked are going to be experiencing who, are, who remain on the earth, who did not fulfill the covenant with Christ. But look at how long-suffering and patient God is, that he would even give them a chance to experience all of that, to experience his great wrath, to be convicted and shown what they have done, and then to come to life after the thousand years have ended and be given another chance to be saved, even if only as one escaping the flames. I mean, that is intensely merciful. After all they will have done, God is going to give them a chance, as long as they were not part of that group that received the mark of the beast. And they'll be given a chance to guard the temple and the work that is to be done in it. Now, don't think of this as a building structure because it's not a, it's not a building structure. We already know that John said he didn't see a temple in the next age. So this has spiritual significance. So there's going to be something that they're able to do, some sort of duty that they have and that they will be working off because we do see that there is a, a year of freedom that is referred to with, with regard to the third temple. Nevertheless, they will not be allowed to minister before the Lord. He is set on them enduring the consequences for their sin. So I hope this kind of answers some of your questions regarding what are these trumpets? What is God's wrath? Does that mean he hates us? Does that mean? No, it doesn't mean that. He disciplines those he loves. And punishment is included in discipline. Discipline is not necessarily punishment, but punishment is discipline. He is not going to have unruly children. He is not going to have children who have more power than he does, who try to exert power over him. That's, that's not what he does. That's not what he's established. He requires us to understand who we are to him and who he is to us and to get into that posture to conform to it and just as, you know, if you're watching Super Nanny and you see when she implements all of that, everybody benefits from that. The children are happy, the parents are happy, and there is a harmonious home. Those of you who've been called out of, you know, from the world, called out of the world and drawn to him, you know that to be true. You were not happy back then. I wasn't happy back then. I was absolutely terrorized and tormented by a spirit of fear that kept compelling me to do things that I thought made me happy. I thought that, you know, living a sinful life, according to my flesh, drinking and carousing and being out, you know, at a club or whatever it was that I was doing, I thought that made me happy. I thought buying expensive things made me happy. That did not make me happy. I had absolutely no idea what that even meant. But see, the trick of our flesh and the trick of the world is that the world is going to make you happy. The things of the world are going to give you joy and peace and security. And it's a big old lie. It, there's so much deception in that. It didn't matter how much money it, I made. It didn't matter how much I had in savings or investments. I never felt secure. And the weird thing is that I do the exact opposite now. I trust in God. I use my own resources in order to share this ministry. I don't make money off of this ministry. And if I did, I would have to question whether I was actually in him and speaking correctly because he tells me the world is going to hate this. So how, how in the world would I be making a living on this message? There's no way. I pay into this. I'm in the negative. This is not a worldly business for me. I've been there, done that. I was very, very successful for the world. And 
the world was not loyal, quite frankly. It did not keep its promises to make me happy, that's for sure, or to heal me or anything else. But doing the exact opposite of what the world has told me to do has brought me so much joy in the Lord. It's also brought me grief. That's part of the deal. But even in my grief, I rejoice because I know where my grief comes from. I know that my grief is godly grief, that it comes from the spirit of God and that he has enabled me to have spiritual eyes and understanding to see how bad it is in this world. So you see, the goal is not for us to become happy or anything else. We need to differentiate between happiness that the world promises, which is a fallacy, and the joy of the Lord, which is true and eternal and will not completely be fulfilled until we've done what we came here to do, become who we came here to become, and then we're with him forever. It cannot be fulfilled. We cannot have happiness and eternal peace here in this world. It's impossible. We have to be joined with him. And if we are truly in him, we are going to concurrently feel the joy of the Lord, but we're going to feel grief. There's absolutely no way that we can live here and be comfortable. I hope this has helped for you to understand a little bit more about God's heart, what he's established and who he is and how long suffering, patient and loving he is. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.